Hi, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm uh, happy and honored to give you uh, to give this introductory uh, session on reparations. Uh, but before I start, I would like to uh, give you my disciplinary perspective. Uh, the The concept of reparations, uh, the concept of reparation, has been studied from different uh, angles uh, in in different disciplines, uh, whether it's economy, uh, sociology, law. Uh, philosophy, and um, I would like to uh, uh, to give you uh, more details from where I I speak and I stand when I uh, talk about this uh, concept of reparation. So uh, during my PhD dissertation, I studied uh, mobilization of apartheid victims uh, in South Africa before American courts and South African courts. And uh, within this uh, dissertation, I treated the question of uh, uh, of uh, reparations, how this concept was appropriated and used by um, uh, victims' movements, uh, NGOs, um, lawyers, um, and different group of actors. So I'm not, uh, and after that, uh, I work uh, for different NGOs and uh, uh, human rights um, organizations mainly in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, organization which were, which were implementing uh, uh, programs of reparations. Um, and at this stage, I'm not, uh, I'm not going, I'm not going to give you a, uh, a, a presentation on the meaning of the concept of reparations, but rather on uh, how this concept is uh, used, appropriated in different contexts by different actors. Um, and what are the uh, the concrete implications of this uh, of this multiple uh, multiple uh, uses? I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna share my screen with you. Um, I think it will be more helpful since I have different uh, concrete examples. This. Uh, Um, okay, uh, so we we have uh, we have um, uh, I know you have just read the text of uh, uh, written by uh, Pablo de Greff on the concept of uh, reparations and on the meaning of uh, on the and on the distinction between different contexts where the term of reparation is is used uh, in his uh, text. Pablo de Greff uh, makes a distinction between uh, international law, uh, where the concept of repression can take different forms. He talks about restitution, compensation, rehabilitation, satisfaction, and guarantee of non repetition The other context in which the term repression is frankly, frequently used, according to uh, Pablo de Greff, is uh, the design of uh, of programs uh, of uh, reparation programs with massive coverage, um, and he uh, he insists on the difference between uh, these different contexts um, and uh, explaining how one uh, in the in context of international law uh, the concept of reparation has a, a kind of juridical uh, meaning, uh, whereas in the second one it's uh, the reparation are, are apprehended much more as a political project. And I would like to, um, to, to, uh, to stop on this point to share or to illustrate uh, uh, the, how these distinctions or how different appropriation of the concept of reparation play, uh, uh, play out in, the, in, the, in a concrete case, which is uh, the case of apartheid uh, victims mobilization in South Africa. I would start by this by this uh, example of uh, apartheid victims mobilization. So, um, as you know, um, the at the end of apartheid, uh, the saga the South African government set up a truth and reconciliation commission in charge of telling the truth of the crimes of apartheid, grant amnesty if certain conditions uh, were made. Um, and proposing recommendations uh, for reparations. Uh, 
the image on the on the left uh, illustrate one of the session of the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions. This so this commission was uh, was held between 1996 and 1998. Some of the work continue after, but the main uh, sessions were held at, uh, during that time. Um, and the the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, which uh, interpreted uh, interpreted apartheid violence as a human as human rights violations related to physical integrity, um, and as observed by uh, Mahmoud Mandani and many other scholars after uh, this narrow interpretation of apartheid violence has the consequence and has the consequence of putting aside or uh, the structural character of apartheid injustices, uh, of not considering the social economic violence of the of the of apartheid system, and uh, and that the level of reparations uh, this has a consequence since. Uh, there is only a limited number of um, of people uh, that were considered as victims of apartheid uh, that have that have been given the status of victim of apartheid. It's only twenty two thousand people who could benefit from individual reparations. Uh, the the small nuance that I. I, I uh, I could bring on, on. I can bring on this aspect is that in the, um, the 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 TRC, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission discourse, uh, was aware that um, of course apartheid uh, uh, involved much more discriminations. But people who have been given the status of victims and who could have access to reparation uh, were only twenty two thousand. Um, in the in the early two thousand, uh, in the early two thousand, a group of victims uh, of apartheid victims decided to go to court uh, to court uh, before American courts, and that's in the image that we have on the uh, on the right side. They went to court and they sued uh, multinational uh, corporations. Uh, in, uh, that were accused of having aided and abated the apartheid uh, regime. Uh, in this trial, uh, the victims challenged the concept of reparations um, that was based on the physical violence, on the physical integrity. And they, they are, one of the main arguments was to say that uh, entire communities were affected by apartheid. Uh, a system of discrimination uh, a product const, uh, constitute a system of, the, uh, of discriminations that affected every aspect of, of uh, the existence of uh, uh, Black populations from most intimate uh, relations with whom you could marry uh, to the places where you could study, where you could work, where you can travel, where you can live. So this structural character of apartheid uh, and consequently, the reparations cannot be individuals cannot be uh, apprehended on the uh, uh, at the individual basis. They must take into account this structural dimension. Um, so this lawsuit has uh, has been uh, uh, has been brought into court in uh, 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 in two thousand and two, um, and. Um, and it, it and stayed in court till uh, 2015, but um, uh, but um, it couldn't go further because of the legal proceedings and all the challenges of bringing uh, a South African case or facts before American courts. We could go further uh, into further details uh, uh, later on, uh, but I'm I'm going to limit myself here on this question, on, on this uh, aspect. But uh, what is important here to, uh, to keep in mind or to, uh, uh, on this aspect of reparations, it's, first of all, it is, um, this case illustrates how it is important to pay attention uh, on the concept 
uh, how the concept of reparation is approached and appropriated by different actors, whether it's state actors, but to look also how people, uh, uh, how movements, uh, NGOs, uh, victims uh, can formulate and reformulate demands uh, on and negotiating and, and negotiate the sense of reparations. So all this, all that to say that the, the meaning of reparation is not something that is fixed, that is rigid, is something that evolves and that is, uh, that can be, uh, that can, that evolves over time and over space, as we see here for what is, what, what happens in the South Africa and how it goes into American courts. And, uh, um, and it, uh, that is contested. Um, the second element that, um, uh, that this case uh, highlights is that uh, if we if we understand the concept rep, uh, the concept of uh, reparation as it has been defined by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, and if we compare it to how it is defined by victims' movements in the case of uh, uh, when they go into America uh, to American courts, we can see that the, these these there are uh, concrete implications, there are significant concrete implications, uh, because in one case, we have 22,000 people who have access to reparations, uh, whereas in the second case, uh, their argument uh, was to say, if we have, if we take into account the multiplicity of discrimination that, uh, that were inherent for, to the system of apartheid, then we have to reconsider the number of people who have uh, who are victims and who have access to reparations. Uh, so um, we can see that behind this uh, uh, maybe abstract definition, there is uh, significant differences and concrete uh, uh, concrete stakes that are important. I would like to move to the um, uh, to a second case, uh, which is. Uh, the link, uh, a, a second case, but which highlight, highlights the importance of uh, uh, the significance of the link between the qualification of violence and reparations. Um, in other words, what kind of violence can be repaired uh, and what can violence and, and can be repaired? What kind of uh, victims have access to, uh, to reparations? Um, the most significant or the most telling uh, case in this regard for me concerns uh, the demand for reparations uh, expressed by Namibia and the uh, Obaherero, Nama and San communities to Germany. Uh, it, uh, reparations or demand for reparations that have been, which have been expressed um, concerning the genocide against those populations at the end, at the beginning of uh, the 20th century. Uh, the, the process of claiming uh, this reparation began in 2005 with interstate uh, uh, discussions between Germany and Namibia. And for a very long time, uh, Germany, uh, but also other former colonial powers have been advancing the intertemporal principle. So this is a principle um, in international law, which stresses that a state is uh, responsible for violation of international law only if at the time of the violation or of its continuing effects, uh, the state was bound by the legal provision it transgressed. So in other words, uh, and this is the argument which has been given by uh, uh, by, by Germany, uh, they at the time of uh, I, I, at the time uh, the genocide was committed, they were not uh, they not they were not violating any international law, uh, and therefore there is no obligation uh, to provide reparations. Uh, this argument has been used by uh, has been used uh, by Germany, uh, and. And is still, and somehow still uh, being used by uh, Germany, but it also um, it has been also being used by uh, by many former colonial powers uh, 
uh, as here you can see the um, the image here at the Durban conference, which is uh, the conference, the one of the biggest conference on uh, on, uh, on uh, organized by the United Nations in 2001, 20 years ago, um, uh, on racism, and uh, when many states expressed the need for reparations uh, within this conference, the respond. Uh, the response, sorry, of uh, of uh, many colonial, former colonial powers was to say, uh, to advance this principle. However, um, some uh, scholars, and uh, I think that is also the case for the UN, uh, the UN Special Rapporteur on a, a question of reparations, uh, it is to say that there is an exception. And there is an exception if um, if direct consequences of uh, of these acts extend into a time when the act and its consequences are considered international wrongful. So, for example, that means that we could not use the, um, uh, this for them in their interpretation. We cannot use this principle uh, for racial discriminations now because they are the consequences of. Uh, um, of these facts that happened at a time uh, where state had no legal international legal obligation, because we still we we have direct direct ongoing consequences of this of these facts. Uh, this case uh, for me, this case for me uh, is a uh, it's. It's illustrative of uh, uh, different, uh, uh, different important, significant points. The first and the first point that I want to insist upon is that the moment when the facts happen, uh, the facts for which people are asking the reparations or reparation claims are made, uh, uh, that moment is fundamental, since it determines whether state can be liable. On the basis of international law and ask reparations. This is the first uh, um, key element. The second element, uh, what this case is illustrative uh, of, is the, um, the paradox uh, faced by reparations uh, movements. Since in order to demand uh, the, the paradox that they have to use uh, tools, international if they use international law, uh, they are constrained to a, uh, to a legal system uh, and, with, and with its limits and principle, uh, which has rendered possible uh, the colonial system. So they have to operate in a system that was, uh, that was at the basis of a colonial uh, phenomenon and uh, to challenge the, the, to challenge that system on the basis of uh, the, that legal system is quite constraining and imposes of the of the uh, uh, number of limits. Um, and this leads me to my uh, the third uh, point that I would like to uh, and the third and last uh, point that I would like to to share with you. Uh, or, I would even say of questions. So if we think that uh, international law is, uh, is limiting uh, because of certain principles that have been set up at a moment where colonialism was, uh, uh, was um, prospering, uh, if, we, if we think that it's limiting, then what kind of model of justice should we use or could we use if we want to ask for reparation? What could be the alternative to, repar to uh, international law? Um, and um, one of, uh, one of the, the, the case that could be, uh, that is interesting or, uh, uh, here is, um, is, um, is the Canadian, is uh, the, the, the case of uh, of reparations uh, in uh, in Canada. So 
uh, before I uh, before I, I address the image and the the quote, uh, the citation that you see here, I would like to uh, just give you a little bit a uh, little bit of background. Um, so as you may know, in the from the late uh, 90s, uh, 19th century to 1996, uh, the government of Canada operated uh, the Indian uh, residential school system with the goal of assimilating indigenous children by uh, indigenous children by stripping them of their traditions, customs, uh, values, uh, languages. And uh, the children were subjected to different uh, to different physical abuses, uh, sexual and, uh, and uh, emotional abuses. And in the early 90s, uh, former students of this system decided to uh, litigate, um, uh, to, ask for report, uh, to, rep to ask for reparations uh, to, the, to the government, but also to the churches that were involved in, in this system. And they, uh, they launched um, in, uh, uh, a lawsuit, and this lawsuit led to a, a settlement with the, with, the, with the government a settlement of five billion uh, dollars, um, uh, and uh, that settlement also involved reparations, uh, reparations which were not not only not on uh, not not only financial reparations but also uh, the acknowledgement of uh, the past uh, wrongs, compensation, rehabilitative measures, uh, including. Uh, physical and psycho psychological health services, legal services, uh, educa ed educational support, and the establishment of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And uh, um, the chief investigator uh, involved in this, uh, in the negotiation of this settlement, uh, has explained uh, that it was possible that settlement was only possible uh, by setting aside. Uh, conventional liberal legal frameworks of tort and civil law in favor of indigenous law and legal traditions. And my point here is, uh, is that, um, is to, to show what is the, what is the, uh, what can be achieved if we, can be achieved if we decide of if we if we follow alternative paths to uh, international law um, and uh, for me uh, and this is uh, more a question and I think something that we will address in the different uh, in the different uh, uh, workshops or, or the different presentation that uh, that will follow uh, uh, in the modules is to understand to what extent the, uh, the, the transitional justice framework could be useful uh, in addressing uh, or responding or colonial, uh, addressing colonial violences, injustices, colonial, but also slavery. Why do I, uh, why do I bring this question of transitional uh, justice framework? Um, I I think I um I think about transitional justice framework because um the the original idea behind transitional justice is that legal practitioner and that's in the late uh, late nineties uh, some legal practitioners uh, ha uh, expressed the need uh, to question the centrality of the criminal trial as a way to respond to uh, mass violence. And the, there was a desire among these uh, legal practitioners to, uh, to look at the mechanisms that were used in different in a, uh, uh, mechanism for resolving conflicts in the African states, uh, in, a, in some uh, in Asian state, uh, South America, but non-Western uh, non -Western concept of, uh, of, uh, of seeking individual responsibility. And they were, uh, and they, they, and within this interrogation emerged the idea of uh, using some concept and the mechanisms, truth and reconciliation commission. Of course, uh, that was the 
the original uh, original ID in the uh, in the uh, in the in the 80s, but after that, um, the the transitional justice fieldwork has evolved and has uh, come to include um, uh, criminal uh, criminal trials. Uh, I'm not here to say if it's a it's a a, a good uh, I mean it's a uh, a good or, or bad evolution, but uh, I uh, we know that the the field has evolved and has come to include this evolution, um, and has come to be much more uh, uh, it's much more uh, used by international organizations, NGO, United Nations with all the technicalities it involves. But at the, uh, at the beginning of this interrogation, there was the need to, uh, to, to question the centrality or the, the Western use of, uh, of trials. And, um, and um, yeah, what I found it, what I found it uh, uh, interesting in this, uh, in this uh, debates about reparation and uh, about reparations for colonialism is to, to see if these models that are most of the time used in the, in, the, in the global South, if they can be used to rethink the way we think about trials, uh, the way we think about uh, litigation uh, regarding uh, colonialism and slavery um, in, the, in the Western societies. Um, so all this to say that it's uh, the concept of reparation is not uh, is uh, is uh, it's it's not something it's not I mean to conclude it's not something that is uh, that is uh, rigid rigid it's not something that has a fixed meaning it's something that is is evolving over time and over space but it is also a concept that is evolving in the midst of many. Uh, transformations of international law, of transitional justice, of other uh, of other mechanism and practices that are uh, also inherited from uh, from the the history of the legal uh, the legal systems and uh, 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 and practices of resolving conflicts. Mm. Yes, so. That's it. Um, let's. Uh, we can. Yeah, we can. Uh, we can. Uh, I think that we can. Uh, um, dig. Or we can go deeper into, into some uh, aspects within the uh, Q and A, uh, and of course within the modules. Uh, thank you. <laughs>